morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Carlo. That was fantastic. I, apparently, I can look around corners, which is pretty cool. Uh, thank you for coming out this morning. I wanted to share with you some of my personal experience in going into the cloud, uh, but also share with you some of the things I've learned in the past two years from literally 250 customers that I've talked to. <clears throat> so this is the truth. You know, right now, everyone, and I understand many of you are already in the cloud and cloud native, but this is the driver. Uh, companies all over the world have to go to the cloud. They know this. They have to adopt Agile and DevOps. They know this. What they don't know is how to do it, right? So maybe you can help them get there. When you think about uh, sort of the evolution, right? We are, we're in a different age now. This is a dramatically different age than what we've known. So I have the privilege of having lived in a time when there was no internet or even computers, really. <laughs> I'm old enough. Right? So I've lived through one big transformation with the internet, and now I have the great privilege of living through a second major transformation with cloud. And cloud, to me, is taking us to a completely new level of what's possible in the world. So just a quick thing on AWS for those of you who may not know. Uh, you know so we have offerings in all dimensions of technology, and if you look at the, the breadth of things that we offer, it comes from customers. So when you tell us we need help with artificial intelligence, we need help with uh, IoT, we need help with anything you can think of, most likely we will build it. So 95% of what we have actually comes from customer requests. Drilling in further, and Carlo alluded to this, we have a huge palette to paint with, 125 plus services now. When I started this, uh, my journey in 2016 or so, I think we had maybe 80 or less than that. So it's growing at a tremendous pace. So Carlo alluded to the challenge of how do you keep up with this constant innovation and constant new developments. And my advice to you is don't worry about everything that's coming out. Just pick the things that matter to your business, that matter to your use case, and focus on those things. It's a little bit like going to a home improvement store. What is that called here in Germany? Toby? Obi. So if you go to Obi, right, you don't have to know everything that's available. You're just going in to get the thing that you need and you get out, right? So think of us that way. We have everything you need, but you don't need everything. So just pick the things you need and help yourself. <clears throat> so what I want to share with you is a little bit sort of the, my personal story. When I, uh, 2014, I was working in the U.S. at a company called Experian. Experian is very similar to Schufa in Deutschland. Uh, and Experian was sort of not moving as rapidly as we wanted to. So we needed to do something. And what we decided to do, and what I proposed, is going to the cloud. This may not be a dramatic uh, insight today, but in 2014, we had a policy that said we will never go to the cloud. So it was a big leap for us. And when you look at this image here, a lot of our IT systems are really accreted, right? They've grown over time. Uh, we've, I call them the Borg, if you're familiar with Star, the Star Trek image of the Borg. You bolt things on, you have new things, you just make it work somehow. And in the old days, we would buy systems that did a tiny piece of what we needed, and we bought the whole suite and never actually used it and kind of integrated it somehow and wound up with something that looks like the city where things are kind of organically grown uh, without a clear plan and vision. Uh, so if you continue with this analogy, you know, this building here is the first skyscraper. <laughs> it's not very tall, right? So people, when they first had this idea of we want to go bigger, we want to go taller, we want to have a bigger structure, started small. And now, of course, we know that we have buildings that are hundreds of feet high, or hundreds of meter even, high, and very complex. The point here is you start with something smaller and you evolve to the larger, more complex system. And eventually, you get to a pl place where you're building the smart city. We all talk about smart cities now. It's a deliberate approach to building better structures for purpose, right? And we want to be intelligent about this. We want to be thoughtful about this. And we want to create things that have value for people. Cities are about people. So I'm going to end with this analogy here and get back to our point, which is if you want to reinvent yourself, if you want to become more innovative, you know, how do you do that? And we, you know, we often, I often talk to board members and executives, and they have a slide, and the slide says, go cloud native, or it says, innovate. 
but it doesn't say how. And people are scratching their head and they're saying, wait, you're telling me to innovate, but I can't fail. Those two things don't mix. So there's a challenge here, and the challenge is actually digital transformation, the cultural change that has to happen along with it. So if you think about Amazon, not Amazon Web Services, Amazon had this question. <coughs> it started as a bookseller. Everyone thought of Amazon as a bookseller. And a little over 10 years ago, we decided to become a technology provider. And when we did that, Wall Street reacted very badly, and they said, what are you doing? You are absolutely insane and crazy. You are a bookstore. You're not a tech store, right? And again, Carlo talked about this idea that everyone now it has to be a software company. We realized that and made it available to others. And here again, the focus for us was always about what do our customers need? They need books, yes, but they also need technology. So we want to provide that. We want to provide anything that our customers ask us for. Here's another example. When you think about agriculture, you think about big, big, heavy equipment, farm equipment, right? Farm equipment, it's mechanical, it has wheels, it drags things around. But really, it is now a technology provider as well. When you think about these large uh, agricultural systems, they actually measure the depth of which a plant is planted. They measure how much fertilizer to give each individual seed or seedling. This requires a tremendous amount of precision and requires a lot of technology to go into it. You know, IoT, sensors, data analysis, and all of this has to happen very, very quickly. So when you think of a machine like this, this is no longer just an agricultural machine. This is a computing platform, a data analysis platform, an IoT platform. And so everything, and again, Carlo alluded to this as well, everything will become invisible, right? Technology will become more and more invisible. So when you think about how do you get to this innovative state, how do you actually do this, it's not just a matter of implementing technology. The technology is actually the easy part. So in 2014 through 2016, I took uh, Experian into the cloud, and I thought it was going to be relatively easy to do so. The technology was, in fact, easy. You put smart people, and I, there's a room full of smart people here, you put them in front of the equipment and, and the solutions and the technology, and you guys can build amazing things. But when you're confronted with the legacy of the organization and the legacy of the culture and the old ways of thinking, that's really hard to change. It's about changing people's mindset. So here's one mindset, activity-based work. How many of you have grown up in project land? Everything's around projects, right? I hope I see all the hands go up. <clears throat> because what we've done in the past, we had somebody had an idea, so someone like Carlo had an idea, I think we should build some new awesome thing, and you put together a project plan, you bring in people for the duration of the project, the project has a beginning, an end, a budget, a deliverable, and then you start working on it. And then when you're done, everyone goes back into the labor pool and back to a new project, and you move on, and if something breaks two years later, who do you call, right? Uh, the poor person in the operations center gets the call at two in the morning and they have no idea who to ask for help because you're all now working on a different project. Contrast that with an outcome-based approach and hopefully you're all doing this already, but if not, I highly recommend you move in that direction because when you do an outcome-based approach, you take ownership forever. So this is what we do at uh, Amazon Web Services. All of our services are owned by a team forever. And the team has complete ownership. They have autonomy over that service or feature. They can make decisions. They can go really fast. This is about speed. This is about speed to market and about delivering and delivering great services to your customers. So the idea here is instead of bringing the team to the work, you bring the work to the team. And when you bring the work to the team, you get these these benefits, you get focus, you get, you get ownership, you get uh, fast decision making, because the, 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 uh, the smaller the decision making process is, the faster you can go and make decisions, the faster you can get things to market. You know? And so in the old days, my old days, it would be, I would have an idea, I would take it to the board, the board would approve it, I would get funding, then I would buy the equipment. Six months passed before I ever built anything, right? 
And then every time I wanted to make a change or change direction, I needed board approval, I had you know, 20 meetings, versus having a team just moving very quickly and making decisions constantly and going as fast as you possibly can. Uh, one note here is the divide between business and IT. You know, in the old days, the business thought of IT as a cost center, and maybe it still does in many places. And business folks would write a pro proposal, they would write requirements, they would throw over the fence, IT would catch it and build it, and maybe deliver what was envisioned, and maybe not. But there was always a break, always a division between IT and business. And IT might become the department of no, or the department of not now, or the department of it's not secure enough, and the business got used to A, this is a cost center, and B, IT doesn't really want to do what we ask them to do because they're too slow. That's craziness, right? We should bring that together and say, IT is the business. And with IT is the business, you can go a lot faster. <clears throat> so how many of you have heard of two pizza teams? Probably everyone, no? <clears throat> okay, maybe not. So two pizza teams is uh, how we think about the team structure and size at Amazon Web Services. And Two pizza team simply means it's the size of a team that you can feed with two pizzas. Now I grant these are American pizzas, not German pizzas <laughs> or Italian pizzas. <laughs> uh, so maybe eight people, maybe 10 people, right? Small, why do you want a small team? Because again, if you have a large project and maybe you had 50 people on a team before, you can't possibly have 50 people standing in front of a whiteboard having a conversation. You can't possibly ensure that all 50 people on a project team know all the information that everyone else knows. But if you're eight people, you're 10 people, everyone has the same information. You can sit around the table, you can have a debate, you can argue, which is healthy actually, and you can move really fast. And you can support each other in a much better way because you're just people talking to each other. You remove a lot of the overhead that you have with larger teams. Uh, a note on culture. <clears throat> so Amazon is very, very deliberate in the culture that we want. So we hire people that exemplify particular cultural traits. Culture is sort of the software of an organization, if you think about that. And it happens to us most of the time. It just, you realize one day you wake up and you say, ah, oh, 20 years have passed. We have a culture that came out of who was here before, the problems we've run into, the market conditions, the people we've hired, but it's sort of accidental. But you can turn that around and say, I want a particular kind of culture. I want a culture that is innovative. I want a culture that moves quickly. I want a culture that is willing to take risks. I want a culture that creates new value for my customers. And you have to be deliberate about that. Who do you hire? What kinds of uh, cultural norms are you looking for? And so what you're looking for are these trends where you say, we're getting from an individual system to a product mentality. We're going from huge batch sizes to really tiny batches where it becomes streaming. Streaming is batching. A batch is simply a particular special case of streaming, really, right? It's just a slow stream. <laughs> uh, you want to get to decoupled architectures, loosely coupled, right? Because these, these very complex monolithic applications have challenges. All right. uh, this is our leadership principles. If you haven't seen them, there are 14 of them. They start with customer obsession, they end with deliver results, and anything in between is how we do that. So I encourage you, these are all available online, I encourage you to take a look at these. They have some nice descriptions about them. These are really helpful. You can take them, take the ones that make sense to you, leave the others, and make them your own. I'm moving quickly because I have a lot of material I want to cover. <laughs> so now we've talked about re-architecting the organization and the purpose of the organization. Let's talk about the technology very briefly. So the first thing we tell our customers is you have a tech museum in your data centers. And I had a tech museum with 30-year-old stuff before when I was working for the US Navy. And how, how in the world can you protect systems that are 30 years old? Right? It's, a fallacy. it's a lie. When we say we can you know, have security consciousness, we're going to build a better wall around systems that are antiques. It's craziness. Why are we doing that? So let's fix that. Let's move things into the cloud as fast as possible because the cloud has a much better security footprint than we could possibly have on our own. And then, when we do that, we can actually do some modernization, 
we can find additional value, we can unlock some hidden things in there like data. Yeah, nice graphic, all right. <coughs> uh, quick example, this is a company I used to work for, Edmunds.com. This is a media company that does reviews on car purchasing. And you see, just from a savings perspective, and you know, Carla talked about the four dimensions of your business, of their new relic business. Uh, it's all about data. It's about understanding the KPIs that drive who you are. And so for Edmunds, they focused on cost first, but they've unlocked other value. What's interesting here is by being very thoughtful and careful and moving into the cloud, they were able to have this massive reduction in cost. Now, this is not just a cost savings. This is actually a reinvestment. Because when you can drive down cost through commodity architectures and commodity services, you can reinvest that into your innovation and into your product, right? Doesn't mean automatically that you're gonna cut people or you're gonna reduce things, no. Reinvest and build new value with this newfound savings that you have. Uh, one note on the KPIs, uh, when I went through this process at Experian, so we had a, you know, we had a network operations center, 24 seven kind of operations. You have all the usual metrics on the wall, you know, uptime, performance, utilization, and so on. But I actually put a new metric on the wall up front, right in the center. And my metric was revenue. I said, this is about business. This is not about IT. IT is how we do business. So I put that in my knock. And I said, what is the revenue today and how does it compare to yesterday? And if it doesn't fit within a variance, then I want to understand why. So instead of waiting for a signal to come through the system that says something's broken, you can look at the customer behavior measured in revenue as a KPI. When you uh, go through this process, you know, you can, you can scale out. You can take an old application that could not possibly survive a successful marketing campaign. You know, like think of Black Friday. You know, sometimes Black Friday crashes the systems because there's too much demand. But in the cloud, you can scale out and grow with the business as needed. You can also add redundancy in. So you get uh, COOP, you get recovery operations, disaster recovery kind of automatically without having to do anything. And then this is the fun part. This is what I think is fun, so I'm maybe not normal. But I think it's fun to take a monolithic application, one of these old systems. We had certainly one that was 12 years old uh, at Experian, and we decided to break it apart and make it loosely coupled. Because every time we wanted to release something new into the system, on one side we broke something somewhere else, and we had no idea why it broke. These hidden dependencies inside these monolithic architectures are really hard to understand. Nobody knows after 10 years how everything works, and there's uh, a lot of unintended consequences when you're building some, some things. So you need an army of QA, you need testing, and it still breaks, right? We had an army of QA, and our customers always found new ways to break our system. <clears throat> so we did a strangler pattern. We started to strip out functionality and started to go down the path of microservices. How many here are working on a microservices architecture. <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. So then this is, you know how this works, right? So you, you go through an API process, you continue to break up the monolith into tinier and tinier services. By the way, we had this fight internally, what's the right size for a microservice? You know, so I had, it was like a religious war. I had people tell me, no, it's gotta be a thousand lines of code. Others said, well, you can go up to 10,000 lines of code. Who cares? <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? So break it down how you need to. I decided that I was going to go kind of big and then break it down over time versus having the perfect solution because once you live in microservices, it is so easy to iterate and to change them as you need to. So then here is the complexity, right? So you move the complexity from the business logic of the monolith into the API layer. And this is where New Relic comes in, right? Because this is really hard when something breaks to understand what the root cause is. Tracing the root of a problem in a distributed architecture is really hard. So that's why I was pleased to accept Carlos' invitation. This is exactly the kind of tool that you need. When I did this in 2014, we made our own tools, right? We used open source tools, which are cool and wonderful, but they require a lot of work. And I would have much preferred to have something that would take care of that for me. I didn't have to worry about it on my own. Ah, and now how many of you are serverless? Come on, somebody. <laughs> okay, a couple. <laughs> Th 
this is where it's, where it's at, right? So if I had to do this all over again, if this was 2014 and we had Lambda already, I would have rebuilt everything serverless. This is amazing, right? Because now I just use the services that exist. I build my business logic into my Lambda functions. I only pay for when I execute them. Beautiful. But again, complexity, how do you find root cause analysis when everything's distributed in tiny little increments? And especially when your instances are ephemeral, you know, this was a hard, I'm sure you all know this, but this was a really hard sell for me to tell my operations team that the server will be gone tomorrow or next week. And like, well, wait, what about the log files? How do I know what's going on? Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> it is going to be gone. You will not have it. So if you want log files, you can get them out and figure out how you're gonna analyze them in real time. So I love this stuff. This is, this is the most amazing thing when you, get, when you get into the serverless world and you deconstruct everything into the smallest component possible. Uh, how many of you saw Andy Jassy's presentation last week? A handful. So he talked, and Andy, uh, and Werner Fogel as well. We talked a great deal about breaking components into their smallest pieces and, and uh, deconstructing them and having them stand on their own. When we get to this place where we have everything as a small, discrete piece, it is, becomes really powerful in terms of the evolution of how fast we can actually develop things uh, in a DevOps kind of world. So we have obviously lots of examples, lots of uh, amazing examples. Uh, FINRA, time? How much? Okay. FINRA uh, is an organization in the US that keeps track of the stock market in the US. They are able to record every stock transaction of a day, and they could replay all the transactions that happen, half a trillion uh, per day events, which means they can detect if there's fraud, they can detect if somebody's trying to corner the market, they can detect if something weird is going on, and it's because they have this richness of data. This is about, again, speed, richness of data, and being able to go as fast as possible. Quick case study, Amazon.com, again, uh, we were a monolith. Our monolith was so big that it took one day to compile. It's <laughs> a whole day, 24 hours. And if something didn't work, well, guess what? We had to recompile it the next day, right? This is not fast, and this, this, is, this was not scalable. And I don't know if you, again, if you saw last week's presentation, the reason this was not scalable was actually uh, the database layer. So I would take a look at the uh, reInvent replay on YouTube when it comes out uh, and take a look. It was very insightful and interesting when Werner Fogel talked about his worst day at Amazon. So we decided to go down the microservices route, started very large microservices, maybe, you know, mini monoliths, uh, but over time we decomposed them completely into the smallest components we could possibly have. So you get the scalability, you get the resiliency, if something breaks, it doesn't take down the whole system, it just takes down that one component. Uh, and so you get this very wonderful parallel architecture that you can work on. Uh, we also decided that we're gonna have standards based, and the standards are basically the API contract, and I cannot overemphasize the importance of having a good API contract. And once you define the API contract, you must never break it. So Amazon Web Services, you know, once we decide this is the API, these are the calls we're gonna have, this is the promise we're gonna deliver, whatever we do behind the scenes, that's up to us, but the APIs have to remain constant forever. This is a, a mistake that I made when I went through this process. I changed APIs and broke things all the time and I had lots of angry people yelling at me. So I stopped doing that very quickly. Um, all right, so let's get to the end of this. Uh, have you heard of the OODA loop? Observe, orient, decide, act, OODA. This came out of the US uh, Air Force. Uh, this was a pilot who was flying really old planes in Vietnam, and he had to fight against planes that were actually more modern than his. And the only way he could win a, an air battle was by having a faster decision cycle. So maybe this is not a popular topic in military, but military has a lot of really good thought processes that we can learn from. So the idea here is, when you're working and you're in a competitive environment or even in your own environment, it is really important to understand what's going on as fast as possible. So that's to observe, orient, to kind of figure out what you're gonna do about it, decide what you're gonna do, and then act on it. This loop 
is forever, it never ends. Uh, and this is something that you can apply across the board in all dimensions. And again, this is an area where New Relic can help you. <clears throat> when you think about data, this is, I was alluding to this earlier, in our legacy systems, we have data all over the place. I had dozens, hundred different customer databases at Experian. And the customer schema was always different in every one of them. And the identity of the customer was defined slightly differently in every one of them. That seems like a small point until you ask the business intelligence team to extract all the data and merge it all together and drive the, <laughs> I see your pain, yes, you've done this. It's awful, right? If you, so how do you identify a person? Is it an email address? Is it their physical address? What if the email uh, is shared with someone else? What if you have two people at the same address? How do you parse this, right? And when you have hundreds of these databases that are all slightly different, it's really painful. So that's why we are always talking about data lakes, right? Put everything in S3 in its raw format. You can ingest data anytime you want from all sources, whether it's an IoT source, whether it's a sensor, whether it's New Relic, whatever it is, you can all stream it into uh, S3. And then you have an analysis layer on the other side that you can actually give access to either the business for self-service. Hey, self-service, you don't have to write the reports anymore. Let them do it themselves. That's awesome. <clears throat> or you can have business analysts and, and data scientists do the really hard work and deep dive on the data. If the data is there, you can extract the value. If the data is locked away in hundreds of little databases, it's really hard. So uh, this brings me to the end. The idea around all of this is that speed matters, going as fast as possible matters, DevOps matters. How many of you are doing DevOps? Okay, not enough. <laughs> Sorry, DevOps is rocket fuel, and I'm glad we're gonna have many other presentations today on DevOps. Um, I was able to implement cloud, agile, and DevOps all at the same time, which is really hard to do. But when you do that and you unlock the creativity of your business, and you get out of the way and you can automate all the processes, you get speed. When you get speed, you win. There was a really interesting study by the team around Puppet Labs. Uh, they wrote a book called Accelerate. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Accelerate uh, studied over a five-year period, thousands of customers of Puppet Labs to understand the impact of DevOps. A couple of metrics that I find fascinating. One, DevOps companies can release code 440 times faster than non-DevOps companies. So let that sink in, 440 times. That is competitive advantage. They also found that DevOps frees 40%, 40% of time for the developers. If you can recover 40% of your time because you're not doing all the noise, all the, the hard, boring work, and you automate all of it, Think of what you can do with that 40%. You can create more value, you can do more things for your customers, you can delight your customers with better user experiences, and that's what you want. So take advantage of AWS, take advantage of New Relic, and drive your innovation as fast as you possibly can. Thank you very much.